Hi guys, welcome back to the Swing Guitar Blog. My name is Jonathan Stout, and this is a brand new to me 1935 Gibson L12. Uh, I bought this off of eBay last week, uh, kind of on a lark, and uh, just arrived about two hours ago. Uh, I was so excited. I uh, opened it at the mailbox place, uh, and uh, I'm pretty pretty surprised pleasantly. Um, the thing about this guitar that really struck me uh, when I was looking at the listing was the play wear on the back of the neck, because there's almost no finish back here. And what that generally means is this guitar has been played and played and played until all that finish was gone. And that is usually indicative of a, a really well played instrument that really has a resonant acoustic voice and that really speaks. And I, I can happily say I am not, uh, I'm not disappointed. Um, the one, there's no cracks on the top, which is awesome. Um, there's a slight, tiny little bit of center seam uh, separation on the back, but just really, really slight, tiny little bit. Um, but the, the one blemish is right here. The original pick guard started gassing off, and obviously whoever uh, tried to save the pick guard probably moved where the screw was and just made a kind of a mess of it. Um, but structurally, it looks um, completely fine. It doesn't look like it's going anywhere. There's no cracks coming off of it, and frankly, I don't think it really affects anything. I will probably have that plugged uh, and put a new pick guard on it, um, and I'll probably have Joe Vinico at ArtShop.com make me the new pickup because he does great, uh, great pickups, uh, pick guards rather. Um, so L L12s and L7s are generally structurally exactly the same. Uh, except for some of the cosmetics and the main difference between uh, uh, L7s and L12s and something like an L5 uh, is that uh, generally L5s have ebony fingerboards and a maple neck both of which are brighter than the rosewood fingerboard and mahogany neck of something like an L12. Um, big difference between most L12s and most L7s is most L7s uh, the back is all solid brown uh, but L12s have a nice uh, sunburst back, uh, and L12s generally have gold hardware. Um, this is a 1935. The factory order number and serial number both corroborate that, uh, as well as the cosmetics on this guitar. Um, so uh, it came with 12s, which I will probably change to 13s uh, when I have it set up. Uh, it came with the bridge off and the string slacked, so I've done my best to sort of put it into place. I suck at set up stuff like that, uh, so I'm definitely going to have to go to my local store, Westwood Music, and have my guy Dave Rukinski uh, set it up for me, and I'm sure it'll play uh, even better than it plays now. And it already plays really well and intonates surprisingly well just straight away. Um, I was talking about the playware and how open and resonant it sounds, and just from the get-go... <laughs> So this is a very early advanced model, the first year, uh, when Gibson upsized from 16 to 17 inch guitars, uh, they changed the bracing pattern from parallel to, um, to X-braced. Um, one of the things that I was uh, hipped to uh, is the difference between solid and curved bracing. Um, curved bracing is basically uh, where they put uh, little dados in in the bracing on the side that fits along the top, but they don't go all the way through. So there are these just little slots, and that allows you to sort of flex the brace a little bit to fit it into shape rather than perfectly matching it to the top by carving it. Um, and I was informed that in about 29 or 30 is when Gibson changed to mostly doing curved braces on their L5s, and that generally that was one of the indications of uh, the better sounding uh, pre-war or pre-advanced L5s was the lack of curved bracing and that they had solid bracing. It's not to say that every guitar with curved bracing sounds bad or that every 
guitar with solid bracing sounds good, but it's just one of those things that tends to go along with a better sounding guitar. Uh, I did ask the seller on this to confirm there it was X braced because there are plenty of guitars that came out of Gibson's factory in the 30s and 40s and 20s that have no relationship to the specifications that they're supposed to have either because it was a custom model, a custom order, it was a demo, it was an experiment, it was using leftover parts, or somebody was hung over. Uh, I think Joe at archtop.com told me he calls that the 10% rule. The 10% don't, don't really quite fit spec. Um, the two ES-150s that I've most gotten a chance to play are mine uh, and uh, Craig Gildner's, a friend of mine uh, from DC. Um, and uh, his is a 39 with the triple bound uh, pickup cover, yet it does not have a notch. Mine is a 37 with the single bound and the F factory order number and all that stuff corroborates it's a, it's a 37. Uh, and even the shipping ledgers corroborate that. Um, but it has a notch, so maybe somebody put in a notch after the fact, who knows. Um, but that it shouldn't have had a notch at that point. Um, so it's, it's just sort of, funny the way some of those specifications um, came and went. Um, but this this looks pretty much exactly like what you would expect. Um, X-Brace guitars tend to be fuller and warmer, uh, not quite as loud, not quite as punchy, but still very full. Um, and uh, I haven't been in the acoustic archtop vintage market for a particularly long time. It's sort of a fluke that uh, I was going to be able to look, start looking for a, a vintage acoustic arch top, and I, you know, I have this Eastman that I love that is fantastic. That's really, um, it's one of the best they ever made. Uh, I learned that from one of the reps, uh, the guy that, that found it for me. He said, "Yeah, you know, my job at the end of the day was to play through all the guitars, and you know, every once in a while there would be one that really stood out, and that that's the best one he can remember." Um, and he was lucky enough to forward it to me. Um, but that's an X-Brace guitar that's 16 inches. So it has some of the characteristics of X-Brace guitars, which is their full, its fullness and its roundness um, and its sustain, but it's a 16 inch guitar. So it has some of the cut of a 16 inch guitar that is more focused than 17 inch guitars, which are fuller. Uh, this is 17 and it's X-Braced, so it is double full. Um, but it doesn't lack and it doesn't really want for punch. I mean, I mean it speaks so quickly. Um, but I, I, that guitar, my the guitar I had now, I, I mean, I didn't know what it was about that one that what more could I do? I just know I've played some 20s L5s that are mind blowing, and I've played some some other uh, you know vintage Epiphones that were just 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 amazing and they they have that thing where they just sing with no, no effort uh, and that's that's what I was after and, and if this guitar hadn't been good um, I figured I could probably resell it without too much of a of a hit um, and use it as a learning experience and so far um, this is a uh, very fortuitous learning experience um, but I, what I'm realizing is getting to play this uh, I have something very good to compare it to. Uh, last weekend I was in DC visiting my friend Craig Gildner, who I already mentioned from the Blue Sky Five, He's sort of my brother from another mother. Um, I got to bring him his ES-150 that I found for him and had set up at Westwood Music. Um, and uh, and uh, so we got to hang out all weekend, play guitars, and uh, I got to play uh, all weekend his 1951 uh, parallel braced L7 that he got from archtop.com. Uh, by by that point, Gibson was starting to uh, the the guitars were starting to lose some of their acoustic luster because they were expecting to somebody's going to put a floating pickup on it. Um, so uh, this was one of the last of the really good acoustically viable um, L7s, uh, and that was parallel braced. So I played that all weekend. So uh, in comparing that guitar to this guitar, um, I immediately noticed that this just is feels so pianistic. Um, it just, it, the full range. Um, and I think I'm going to luck out because I think uh, this is going to be a interesting kind of guitar to have um, and that maybe uh, later on down the line, you know, we look at a 20s L5 or we look at a walnut-backed Epiphone Broadway or some other Epiphone that really just 
barks like a mother. Um, and that would be a good counter counterpoint to this because although this barks um, surprisingly well, uh, it does have the fullness. And I would bet that in a band context, it won't bark quite as much as some of the vintage Epiphones I've played. Um, Epiphones do have a fun uh, issue, which is the uh, pre-1937 ones uh, do not have an adjustable truss rod. There is a truss rod in there, um, but it is not adjustable. So to correct the neck, um, you can steam it with clamps, which is the kind of most hard thing. But one of the things you can do is change the frets and using frets that have a narrower or fatter tang, it can sort of spread the guitar out or, or let the guitar kind of natural, the neck of the guitar naturally curve back the other way. Um, anyway, uh, I've yacked enough. Let me, let me let you hear what this sounds like. Thank you. 
next time on the Swing Guitar Blog.